But um, thank you all for coming to see how many of us there are. There's 23, okay. Um, if you've heard me talk about this stuff before, there will be a lot of overlap with previous talks, but um, th this is some combination of current events, uh, events from 2016 on and a little bit of statistics um, and maybe critical thinking about this stuff. Let me see if I can get my slides up. All right, this says I'm sharing my screen. Um, this I think is a slide. Can you, can everyone, can people see that? Yes, it's perfect. Yes, okay, great, okay. Um, so uh, first credit, um, I work on this stuff with a lot of different people and you know, kind of all over the globe. Um, my primary collaborators right now are at University of Melbourne um, at MIT, but they're, they're kind of all over the place. And a number of uh, Berkeley uh, PhD students have worked on these issues. Uh, Kelly Ottoboni's dissertation was a um, big chunk of it was on this stuff. And Jake Spertus and Amanda Glazer are both working on things related to election integrity as well. So um, I want to convince you that there's a problem. If you're not already convinced, I want to convince you that there's a solution, although there's some political pressure uh, making implementing the solution difficult um, and then talk a little bit about some of the statistical tools that turn out to be useful in the context of checking whether election results are right. Um, what I did on my summer vacation. Uh, so I, I testified just this last Thursday in a federal trial uh, that has been ongoing since uh, 2018. This is a landmark case. It's uh, in the um, uh, Northern District of Georgia, if I recall correctly, Judge uh, Totenberg. Uh, she's actually Nina Totenberg's sister. Um, and she is the first federal judge to listen to an argument that voting technology can violate the constitutional right to vote um, if the voting technology is bad enough, insecure enough, Counts some people's votes and not other people's votes. Uh, this, the, the, uh, there's a, currently a, um, the hearing was over a preliminary injunction to prevent the state of Georgia from using their insecure ballot marking devices in the upcoming presidential election and force them to provide uh, hand markable paper ballots for voters who can use them and reserve the touchscreen devices for voters who need uh, assistive technology to be able to cast a vote independently. <clears throat> Interestingly, this case has divided the election integrity community. Uh, some people who are often on the same side found themselves on opposite sides of, uh, of the courtroom. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as time goes by. Um, in particular, uh, Benedita, whose name is, is here. So this is a declaration I filed over the weekend. I testified on Thursday. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, let's see if I can make videos play and things like that. Uh, there is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even, you could even rig America's elections in part because they're so decentralized and the numbers of votes involved. There's no evidence that that has happened in the past or that there are instances in which that will happen this time. All right, so that was President Obama in uh, 2016 before the election saying that our elections can't be hacked. Um, uh, one of the reasons that he gave is that our uh, uh, voting systems aren't connected to the internet, uh, things are so uh, spread out geographically and so on. And I want to give you a little bit of a, um, an indication that maybe that turned out not to be true. In 2016, people in positions of trust told us it would be almost impossible for hackers to change the outcome of a national election because voting machines supposedly never connect to the internet. Those things are not connected to the internet. Sometimes I know of no. All right, I'm just going to pause and tell you some of the personalities. So you probably recognize Comey, 
David Becker used to work for the Department of Justice, then he went to Pew Charitable Trust, now he has his own, uh, I think it's a nonprofit promoting uh, election integrity, sort of. Um, he was one of the people who's actually testifying on the other side in this lawsuit that I was just mentioning. Where voting machines are connected to the internet. This makes it nearly impossible for a remote hacker. Voting machines are not connected to the internet. Those Oops. are not connected. Uh, voting machines. Sorry, the, the, the previous uh, speaker here is uh, back. Let me see if I can back this up a little. Um, this makes it nearly impossible for a remote hacker. Voting this machine. is Tom Hicks. He's one of the uh, election assistance commissioners, so federal agency charged with um, certifying voting equipment, uh, promoting uh, trustworthy elections, and so on. So he's also and not connected to the internet. Those are not connected. Voting machines themselves are not connected to the internet. Uh, so that was Amy Cohen. She is the director of the National Association of State Election Directors. Management <clears throat> system computers are connected to the internet. And if the election management system computer is targeted by attackers and infected, that infection can spread to the memory cards that are going to program all of the voting machines in that entire area. Moreover, many precinct ballot scanners include wireless modems that connect the scanners and the county central tabulators to the internet. And cybersecurity expert Kevin Scoglin wanted to prove So that was Kevin Scoglin uh, testified on our side against the state of Georgia. Um, so he and nine other independent security consultants created their own search engine looking for election systems online. We found over 35 had been left online, and we're still continuing to find more. Yes, and now it's the largest... It's Senator Ron Wyden, who's been one of the strongest uh, proponents of election integrity measures, auditing, requiring handmarked paper ballots, and so on. He's introduced a number of bills, none of which had made it past Mitch McConnell. A ...manufacturer was selling devices that came pre-installed with modems and remote monitoring software. The experts say remote access to election infrastructure is now a five alarm crisis. The states of Wisconsin, Florida, Michigan, Illinois. Okay, um, so back in 2016, one of the, you know, the, Again, I think this was Tom Hicks saying it would take an army to hack into our voting system. Um, and then it was discovered after the election that indeed R Russian hackers had hacked into the U.S. Election Assistance Commission's own website. Um, so, so much for their assessment of cyber threats. Uh, there are a number of arguments that U.S. elections can't be hacked, including the fact that the equipment is protected by physical security. The equipment is not connected to the internet. Uh, machines are tested before election day and the system is too decentralized. We heard some of those arguments from President Obama, um, some from the uh, uh, Commissioner Hicks and, and other people. So on the physical security story, um, it just isn't true. Uh, lots of voting equipment has sleepovers in polling places where it is unattended. Um, I know people who have observed, you know, the back door of election uh, equipment warehouses left uh, open, unlocked, even propped open. Um, often equipment is in school gyms, churches, etc. before the election. The locks on a lot of voting equipment use mini bar keys that you can buy on the internet or pick with a paper clip or a street sweeper bristle or something like that. There don't tend to be good protocols around the use of physical security seals. Very often, uh, the seals that are used, you can steam them off or uh, take them off with a, with a razor blade and a heat gun. Um, uh, sometimes you can buy replacement seals on the internet. The seals aren't even numbered. The jurisdictions don't tend to keep track of the seal numbers that they put on equipment and log to make sure that the seals haven't been broken when they reinspect the equipment. Um, so the SEAL protocol is pretty bad. There's a wonderful story. Um, um, well, his name will come to me in a moment. Uh, Robert, uh, Roger Johnston, who used to do physical security for Argonne National Lab, so around you know, fissionable material, nuclear, nuclear materials. Uh, so you know, very much an expert in physical security. He got interested in election security, went to his local uh, election office to see what they did and, you know, finds this box of ballots that's completely 
covered in, in seals, seal tape and whatnot, except you can flip the box upside down and open it from the bottom without breaking any seals. Um, there generally is not routine uh, scrutiny of custody logs when people pick up a box of ballots from a polling place and take it back to the uh, central office. Um, there typically are not two person custody rules. Uh, there was a, a joke back in the day, or I mean, I think this is a story back in the day that um, when Lyndon Johnson was running for office, his uh, political cronies would ride with the sheriffs in the squad car to babysit the ballot boxes on their way back to the county offices to be tabulated to make sure that the right ballots got there. Um, so physical security is clearly not a remedy. Um, and of course, if we're talking about voting online, which is one of the worst ideas ever conceived, then no amount of physical security can possibly help. So uh, there are claims that the equipment isn't connected to the internet. You just saw Kevin Scoglin, uh saying that, that by doing a relatively simple uh, search, they were able to find systems in uh, 35 voting systems connected to the internet. Uh, for long periods of time. Some of the vendors install remote desktop software on voting systems. This is an absolutely insane thing to do because it basically is providing a backdoor into voting systems that is relatively easily exploited. Most remote desktop software has been demonstrated to be insecure. There's exploits for all of that. Um, Many of these systems have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular modems, and other things. Election officials like cellular modems because they like to be able to send the results back on election night from polling places. Uh, the problem is that you can do man-in-the-middle attacks and inject malware um, when the system connects to a cellular modem, when it's connecting over the internet. Very often, removable media are used to configure voting systems and to transport uh, the intermediate results back for aggregation. Um, there are systems still in use in California that rely on zip drives. Uh, iOmega, the company that makes zip drives, has been out of business for, I don't know, at least 15 years, something like that. Uh, so where do election officials get replacement zip drives when the equipment, uh, you know, when they wear out? They buy them on eBay. Um, if you can't see how insane that is from a security perspective, then um, yeah, uh, go have another cup of coffee. Um, USB drives are being used to move data on and off these machines. USB drives are bootable. There are USB drives that are uh, specifically designed with extra processors on board that let them be full-fledged computers that can then inject mal malware payloads onto the devices that they're inserted in and so on. So, I mean, I, I should point out, I'm giving this talk on an iPad. Um, I will not install Zoom on my laptop um, as an app. Zoom gets root level privileges and access to camera, microphone, and so on. And the, the programming in Zoom is all based in China. The Chinese government, uh, they, they were routing pretty much all of their traffic back to China this spring when people were, you know, when Zoom became uh, so popular after uh, COVID um, started to spread. Uh, there's evidence that they are aware of the content of meetings and um, the encryption really can't be trusted because they have the encryption keys. So I use a dedicated device for Zoom. Uh, it makes this all kind of inconvenient because um, their app for uh, tablets isn't as fully featured as their app for laptops, but I'm not willing to use the app for laptops. And the browser version in a laptop won't let you do things like share your screen. Um, many voting uh, machines have parts from foreign manufacturers, uh, including China. A colleague of mine found Chinese pop songs in flash memory on a voting machine that had been in use for years and years. So somehow the, the vendor of the voting machine had missed the fact that these, that presumably this was put on the board when the board was being built in China, the manufacturer of the voting machine later on missed it. The election officials missed it. It just, it just went undetected. It could just as easily have been malware as pop songs. So that's the, the, the idea that not connected to the internet is protection is both, both, a, both not true, even if the premise were true, um, but the premise isn't true either. Um, and some of the voting machine vendors have really gotten busted for this lately. We're sorry, not, not busted in a legal sense, but caught. <clears throat> Um, so 
it turns out that uh, so this this is addressing the issue of, of testing before you know election day. Um, it's been known for a while that Russia targeted election systems in all 50 states. It just came out in Bob Woodward's book uh, last week that actually they managed to penetrate the voting systems in a number of states, um, not just the 11 that had previously been announced as having their voter registration databases compromised. <clears throat> Uh, one of the, the biggest voting machine vendor in the U.S. is ES&S, Election Systems and Software. Uh, they claimed that they had no form of remote access capability, that they'd never installed remote connection software on any voting machine. That turned out to be a lie. Uh, they, they admitted after being pressed by Senator Wyden that, in fact, they had installed exactly that remote access software on voting machines and pre-installed modems on things that even if the, uh, if, if the purchaser didn't necessarily want a modem. <clears throat> um, there have been some very interesting tests of the security of voting technology over the last few years in DEF CON. Uh, DEF CON is a huge hacker conference that takes place uh, in Las Vegas every year. Uh, starting in 2017, they formed a voting uh, machine hacking village where they bought whatever voting machines they could from eBay or off the internet and let hackers loose to play with them for 24, 48 hours to see what happened. And generally what happened, every single piece of equipment that they got in there for the last, uh, in 2017, 2018, 2019, was compromised, uh, some of it within something like 20 minutes. Um, so really, really not secure stuff. Um, so here, every piece of equipment in the village was effectively breached in some manner. The first machine to fall uh, was hacked and taken control of remotely by Wi-Fi using a vulnerability from 2003. Uh, it was still in use in states in the U.S. Uh, from 20, 2003 to 2014. So anybody could have changed anything. The same machine had a universal default password, which you could find by searching Google. <clears throat> Um, again, I, as I pointed out, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the components of these are made in foreign countries, uh, and in fact, the voting system vendors, many of them are foreign based as well. Uh, this was from 2019. Um, again, they, they managed to get 100 different machines, all of which are currently certified in the US. Every single machine was compromised in two and a half days using many of them with trivial attacks that required no sophistication. Uh, I did one of those attacks, um, which was to recalibrate a touch screen so that when you um, tried to vote for one candidate, in fact, you voted for a different candidate. <clears throat> These pictures, this picture and the one that follows, were taken by Hari Hursti, who's a, a legendary hacker um, who uh, focuses a lot on election security. Um, these were taken in the state of Georgia. And uh, this Dominion Voting D Suite, this is the software that uh, Dominion, which is one of the other big manufacturers of voting equipment used in the United States, although in fact the company is based in Canada. Um, so if you look at, uh, so th this is the, the computer that is being used to run the central scanners, uh, but the software configuration is the same not only on this, but also on the equipment that's used to program the touchscreen voting machines and to scan the ballots and precincts. So if you look a little bit more closely, at what they happen to have installed on this uh, server that's supposed to be dedicated to election stuff, uh, you will see Skype, uh, you will see Spotify, you will see uh, two games by King Games, one called Friends, uh, and I, I don't know what the other one is called. King Games is based in Malta and has offices uh, all over the world. Um, the uh, Asphalt Street Storm game is made by a French software firm, and that uh, Seekers Notes um, uh, game is made by a Russian company. So if somebody wanted to insert malware into Dominion voting systems, all they have to do is insert it into uh, one of these Microsoft ga games that, that is kind of commonly distributed with Microsoft Windows and ends up on, on all of these things because the vendors and the uh, local election officials don't take any reasonable measures to harden their systems against attacks. Um, such measures would include deleting anything that you don't actually need to run an election, plugging up any ports that you don't actually need, uh, making sure that there's physical security over USB ports in particular, and so on. So this is 
clearly just a wide open door to altering election outcomes. <clears throat> um, that I think I already showed you. All right, uh, then there's the claim that these systems are tested before election day. So the idea that you can tell by testing something um, before election day, whether it's going to function correctly on election day is very much wishful thinking. One of the most visible examples of the security flaw in that approach can, is Dieselgate, the Volkswagen Audi Dieselgate. Um, if a system can tell whether it's being tested, it can be programmed to behave in a different way when it's being tested and when it's being used in, in real life. So Dieselgate uh, was this emission scandal where when you put one of these cars onto a test bed to measure its emissions, um, it knows that it is being tested partly because the steering wheel isn't being turned, the way that the, accel the accelerator pedal is being pressed is different from how you would do it if you were driving. Um, and so on. So it actually, it, it, it can tell from sensors that it has that the way it's being used is not typical driving. And under those circumstances, it dialed its own emissions back. But then when you go out on the road, it behaves completely differently in order to be peppier and, uh, and ends up have, having much larger emissions. Northampton, Pennsylvania is an example of a big failure of the kind of logic and accuracy testing that happens before election day. Uh, the first time they fielded a new touchscreen ballot marking device called the Express Vote XL, made by the SNS, that company that lied about having remote access software and modems in their, in their hardware, uh, it failed miserably, including um, registering thousands of votes for voter instructions rather than for candidates. It was so badly misconfigured that this was really obvious, but um, it, it, it went through the pre-election logic and accuracy testing. They just didn't test it well enough. Uh, Los Angeles, California recently fielded a new $300 million voting system that they designed from scratch and it failed catastrophically in, uh, in the primary um, this year. Uh, among other things, it, it, it had problems because electronic poll books that are required in order to enable the system for voting failed or weren't being used properly. It had paper jams. It had all kinds of things that, that really shouldn't have happened. Now, here's some examples of this. Uh, th this was this Northampton County uh, example where, um, uh, you know, tick marks next to candidates that someone selected would keep disappearing. Um, uh, a, a candidate that uh, was reported to have only gotten 15 votes in all, in fact, won by a thousand uh, votes. Um, and people, you know, there's still no satisfactory postmortem to explain uh, what went wrong. Um, interestingly, these companies behave uh, in rather obviously unethical ways. In Philadelphia, um, there, the a commission blessed the purchase, the $29 million purchase of those express vote XLs, which are among the worst uh, from a security standpoint on the market. Um, but uh, this was after they were basically found guilty of illegal contribution, lob lobbying the three person commission who was making the decision about it. They paid a $2.9 million penalty, the highest in Philadelphia history, for hiding the fact that they were you know, lobbying uh, for the purchase of their stuff. And yet, Philadelphia still purchased it. <clears throat> so the idea that you can trust, you, that you can't trust them to behave ethically in a business context, but you can trust them to tabulate the votes accurately is a little bit ridiculous. Um, this is about the problems in Los Angeles. Um, uh, basically massive failure um, when it was rolled out. The Secretary of State, um, uh, Alex Padilla, he was in the state legislature at the time that uh, SB 360 was passed, which was a, a law that allowed Los Angeles to develop its own voting system, provided they did some auditing, including using my methods to, to audit. Um, so he and the LA County Registrar of Voters, Dean Logan, are relatively close. And uh, Padilla, I think, was under a lot of pressure to certify this voting system despite its problems. So he actually certified it despite the fact that it failed the testing that it's supposed to go through in California. 
um, and you can see what kind of lines it is. The, it, the, it ended up failing in practice as well, um, failing even to, to register or to boot up in, in many cases. So this is, this is clearly problematic. There was another hearing relatively recently in which I testified uh, that this system should not be certified. Um, and I can talk a little bit about why if, if we have time. But among other things, it, it suffers from what's called the permission to cheat feature. <clears throat> um, CIDL is a Spanish-based company uh, which has a subsidiary called Clarity Elections. Clarity Elections does the reporting of election results for something like 11 US states. So again, we've, we've outsourced the equipment that we use to run our elections. We've outsourced uh, to, to many, in many cases, to foreign companies, including Dominion. We've outsourced uh, the reporting of election results to foreign com companies. In this particular case, the risk is really, 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 really high. So CIDL is now in bankruptcy, and there is a single investor who is trying to pick up the company, which basically means that one individual could give the order to change election results in 11 states. Um, very often, um, the election re re result reporting, the loop isn't closed by looking at what was posted online and going back to figure out whether it's in fact consistent with the precinct level results um, and county level results that were uh, reported by, by the underlying jurisdictions. In this case, CIDL is doing the aggregation and reporting the votes for something like 11 states. So this is a ridiculous vulnerability. <clears throat> Um, what about the two decentralized argument? Uh, it turns out that the market is very concentrated. There's really about three vendor, vendors that are responsible for almost all of the voting systems in use. Heart InterCivic, Dominion, and ESNS. The number of models that are currently in use in the 50 states and District of Columbia, uh, Puerto Rico, et cetera, are, are, there, there just aren't very many in all. Um, the vendors themselves and the US Election Assistance Commission have been hacked. There are demonstration viruses that propagate across voting equipment. Uh, in the Midwest, there's an example of a company called Command Central that uh, basically operates out of a strip mall. Um, and they're a contractor who programmed thousands of voting machines for several states. They themselves uh, clearly have no IT security. Um, you know, most likely the same equipment. I mean, I don't know this is a fact, but you know, my guess would be that the same computer that they're using to buy things from Amazon is the equipment that they're, is they're, they're using to configure voting machines. So it, it's not, you know, it, anyway, it's, it's obviously just a train wreck waiting to happen. Um, the 2016 election, the outcome could have been changed by changing um, on the order of 20,000 votes in a relatively small number of counties. Um, it, it, it doesn't take hacking the nation's voting systems to hack our presidential election. Um, as I mentioned before, a small number of contractors are, are responsible for the reporting and the whole thing has many weak links. Decentralizing things is not necessarily a way to make them resilient, robust, and safe. Rather, it's a way to get to a point where someone can exploit the weakest link in a very heterogeneous system, a lot of which involves obsolete um, and uh, compromised equipment. <clears throat> All right. so. How do we get to a solution? What's, what's the right answer here? Well, it turns out that an incredibly important technology for election security is paper. Um, and this has been formalized through more abstract notions like something called software independence. So the principle of software independence, which was coined by Ron Rivest and John Wack, is that um, an undetected change to the software of the voting system should not be able to cause an undetectable change to the outcome of the election. Um, if in addition to that, it's possible to reconstruct the correct outcome of the election without rerunning the election, if the problem is detected, then the system is said to be strongly software independent. So paper right now is the only technology that can give us software independence, hand-marked paper ballots that are uh, kept physically secure. Um, they can be tabulated using technology like scanners, but then they have to be audited afterwards. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So security properties of paper, it's tangible, it's accountable. You can say, I sent you know, 750 ballots to this polling place. 
I got back 750 ballots of which this many were voted, this many were not voted, and this many were spoiled. Um, that's not something you can do with digital records. Um, it just, you know, you can, because they're, they're malleable, you can fabricate them, you know, meaning you can create them at will, you can alter them. There's no way to, to ensure that things haven't changed. Um, some of you might be thinking, oh, but blockchain, and I'll explain why blockchain doesn't solve any of the hard problems in voting if we have time. Paper is tamper evident in a way that electronic records are not. It's human readable. You don't need to rely on technology. I need classes, but you know, in general, you can you can uh, you don't need electronic technology in order to be able to read it. So, kind of man in the middle attacks on your ability to read it aren't aren't really possible. And if you want to change a lot of votes and the votes are recorded on paper, that usually requires a lot of accomplices and it definitely requires physical access to the paper. In contrast, electronic systems can be compromised from anywhere in the world um, and you don't need a large army to do it. That said, I'm quite confident that there are large armies of people trying to compromise our voting machines in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea and elsewhere. Um, because a far easier way to destabilize uh, a country's government and um, gain advantage um, is to do some electronic hacking rather than, you know, having to launch a military attack. So this attacking our voting systems is a cheap, easy and bloodless way to, um, to really um, uh, injure our, our democracy. <clears throat> um, security properties of paper. Okay, as I mentioned, so not all paper is trustworthy. Um, it matters how you mark the paper, how you take care of the paper, how you tabulate the votes on the paper, and how you audit things. And the lawsuit in Georgia uh, that I mentioned before is largely over how the paper is marked and curated and audited. <clears throat> so, um, uh, ballot marking devices. All right. The Ballot marking devices have a touchscreen interface and an audio interface and a sip and puff interface typically to allow voters with disabilities to independently mark a paper ballot. <clears throat> that is an incredibly important function. Um, it turns out that many of these systems that are marketed because they are supposed to be accessible end up failing accessibility tests so they don't accomplish their primary goal. But they have a secondary flaw, which is that by putting technology between the voter and the paper record of the vote, they, in essence, make the paper trail hackable. So they encourage people to review their votes on screen, but there's no guarantee that what gets printed on the piece of paper matches what was on the screen or matches what the voter heard through the audio interface. Now, this is taken to an extreme degree um, by some uh, models of touchscreen voting machines, touchscreen ballot marking devices, uh, including this ESNS Express Vote, which has uh, what it's called, what they call AutoCast. So the AutoCast feature, um, let's suppose for the moment that I'm uh, a voter with limited dexterity, I can't handle uh, paper, I can't, I can't, you know, manipulate it, I can't put it into uh, a scanner. Um, and I can't mark it by hand with a pen. So I'm using one of these touchscreen voting machines, this ESNS Express Vote. I make my selections on screen, uh, perhaps using a sip and puff interface. And then when it's time uh, to, to, to cast my vote, um, I'm presented with an option of uh, uh, print the vote and print, print the ballot and spit it out so that I can review it manually or print the vote and cast it into the ballot box. This particular machine does not print the ballot until you tell it whether you are going to look at it. So if you use this autocast feature, it knows you are not going to look at the ballot. It then prints the ballot and drops in the ballot box. So uh, Andrew Appel calls this the permission to cheat feature, basically, you know, you basically, you've told the system that there's no way it can be caught by altering votes on that particular ballot. So this is just absolutely nuts. The system, the $300 million system that Los Angeles just rolled out uh, has a, a related problem um, in that it will print your ballot out for review, but then when you want to cast the ballot, your ballot goes back under the print head of the machine before it gets dropped into the ballot box. So that means that the machine can spoil your ballot, add votes to your ballot, 
It can print a barcode that has, it, it also uses a QR code to record the votes, not just human readable. So it could record a barcode that has votes that have nothing to do with what you, in, how you intend to vote, um, print some of your, print your selections as intended and then add contests and other things so that it matches the QR code before it goes in. So it's just, it's absolutely an open door to cheating. And this is one of the things that I've been trying to get the Secretary of State to um, uh, insist gets fixed before that Los Angeles system gets uh, certified. So um, this paper in Election Law Journal relatively recently with Andrew Appel and Rich DeMillo explaining the security flaws in these devices and why auditing the paper once these devices have printed the ballots um, is really not an adequate remedy. <clears throat> um, there have been people who are advocating saying, oh, well, there's, you can just test the ballot marking devices uh, either using pre-election testing or parallel testing. The idea of parallel testing is you either randomly pull aside some machines in the precincts and periodically have people mark ballots with them throughout the day, or you have poll workers periodically throughout the day uh, use the machines that are in use uh, by other voters to mark a, mark a ballot but not cast it in order to check whether the machine is altering votes. So uh, I did this work with an undergrad who was visiting uh, here last year. We basically showed that um, to get an adequate model of voter behavior to be able to have a reasonable hope of catching um, alterations of votes that could change contest outcomes, you would need to basically spy on millions of voters in, in intimate detail in a way that would completely compromise voter secrecy. Uh, there's no way to use things like the rate at which voters spoil ballots and request a do-over to uh, to tell that there was a problem um, in, in any jurisdiction with less than something like 40,000 voters. And it, it turns out that most jurisdictions have far fewer than that. So there's just, it's just not possible to, do, to test these devices well enough to establish that they didn't alter enough votes to alter election outcomes. <clears throat> All right, so what can we do? I realize my time is almost up here um, for what, what I, at least the time I should be doing the, most of the talking. So right now in the US, we have what I call procedure-based elections. And I'm trying to shift the paradigm to evidence-based elections. So uh, the analogy, a procedure-based election is like a um, brain surgeon saying, um, I followed the rules, I used a sterile scalpel, therefore uh, the outcome of the, of the uh, surgery is fine. Um, rather than saying, maybe we should look at the patient. So um, it, it, what we have right now, we follow rules, we use certified equipment. Um, the certification testing is not that great, but that's a, that's a different story. And at the end of the day, we're just simply supposed to trust the outcome because people claim to have followed the rules and used a sterile scalpel in some sense. <clears throat> what we really want is affirmative evidence that the announced winners really did win. There is no perfect way of counting votes. Any way of doing it, even hand counting, is going to make some mistakes. Every electronic system can be hacked. And the real question is not, did we follow the rules, but did error from any and all sources um, alter who appeared to win the contest? Did somebody win who shouldn't have, appear to win who shouldn't have? So uh, this idea has now been in literature since about 2012. Um, the idea is that elections should be structured to provide convincing affirmative evidence that the reported outcomes, that the reported winners really did win. Um, this has taken off uh, the, the idea of evidence-based elections. People are throwing it around. But um, I mean, some of my disappointment in a lot of this is that people are taking these ideas that I'm actually very proud of and very pleased with and then subverting them in order to uh, whitewash poor, poorly designed systems and poor electoral practices. So you'll, you'll hear people talking about evidence-based elections, but they're not really practiced very, very thoroughly. The other main tool, or one of the main tools in getting to evidence-based elections is something called a risk-limiting audit. Um, I invented this in 2007. It was first published in 2008. And the idea is that um, you can make an end run around all of the electronics and all of the tabulation systems and everything else if you have a trustworthy record of paper votes 
uh, pressure from paper record of votes and if you've kept track of the paper adequately, um, you know, and if you're willing to accept some chance of not correcting a reported outcome, if the reported outcome is wrong, you can usually do this relatively efficiently. And the idea is to take a random sample of actual physical ballots and read the votes on those manually. How you use those data, there's two uh, fundamentally different approaches to using it. One is you just use those data as is. You can think of that as something like an exit poll, except instead of asking voters how they voted, you're asking the ballot what vote is on the ballot. And unlike voters, the ballots have to talk to you and they have to tell you the truth. So you can get a, a lovely, um, you know, truly random sample of ballots. There are reasons for using a variety of different sampling designs, ranging from stratified sampling, sampling with or without replacement, uh, sampling with probability proportional to size and, and other things. I think I'm, I'm burning myself out of time, so I probably won't get there. So what is a risk limiting audit? It's any procedure for reviewing the paper trail that, that has any procedure that has a known minimum chance of correcting the reported outcome if the reported outcome is wrong and never alters a correct outcome. Um, so how do you do that? Um, well, okay, the risk limit is the largest chance that you don't correct the outcome if the outcome is wrong. The wording of this is um, important. Uh, it's not the largest chance of, uh, it, it, it's not the, the chance of not correcting a wrong outcome because that invites kind of a Bayesian view of things where you would take into account what's the probability that the outcome is wrong in the first place. And this is not that. This is a conditional probability. On the assumption that the outcome is wrong, I want to limit the chance that I, that I fail to correct the outcome. So this is something that, that is um, you know, uniform rather than relying on any uh, probability model for how voter, what for voter preferences or whether outcomes are correct. What does wrong mean? Uh, wrong means that an accurate hand count of a trustworthy paper trail would find that someone else won. What does trustworthy mean? Trustworthy means that, that counting it by hand would tell you who really won. Um, okay, establishing that the paper trail is trustworthy usually involves other pro processes. Um, such processes have been, you know, uh, the, the name I used to call those are compliance audits by analogy to financial auditing um, for compliance with various rules, procedures, and so on. Um, but compliance audits would involve things like ballot accounting to make sure that you have kept track of all of the ballots. It would involve reviewing custody logs. Uh, it would involve uh, looking at seals and seal protocols and other things to try to get affirmative evidence that the paper trail really is trustworthy. Absent that affirmative evidence, then audits could easily confirm the wrong outcome or even turn a right outcome into a wrong outcome. So <clears throat> the basic uh, algorithm uh, for a risk limiting audit is um, as long as you haven't looked at every ballot and you don't have strong evidence that the outcome is correct, look at more ballots. So eventually, either you have strong statistical evidence that the outcome is right, that is that it's pointless to continue, or you've looked at every ballot and you know what the right answer really is. So that, can be, that can then replace the reported result if the reported result differs from it. <clears throat> um, if you end up doing a full hand count, that becomes the final result. The National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published a report in, I think it was 2018, uh, called uh, Securing the Vote, you know, Protecting American Elections, or something like that. Their uh, first bullet item uh, is that, uh, this is the, for the executive summary, the first recommendation is we should use human readable paper ballots, and they actually uh, really prefer hand-marked to machine-marked. The second recommendation is do a risk-limiting audit. Um, so these, the RLAs, these risk limiting audits have been endorsed by the National Academies, by the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, the American Cisco Association, League of Women Voters, Common Cause, Verified Voting, countless other organizations that um, um, are interested in election integrity. The, uh, you know, how does statistics enter in? I mean, maybe I, I, I think I may have just uh, gotten myself to a point where I need to skip the technical content. Um, so, yeah, I think I've, um, I'm out of time. I should let us uh, probably continue and we can worry about, there's lots of papers that people can read if they're interested in the technical uh, side of this. Um, 
All right. So <clears throat> what are problems in rolling this out? Uh, what could we do in time for the presidential election? Well, there's a big problem in that 20% of US voters don't vote on paper. Uh, there are states that are rolling out ballot marking devices for all voters instead of reserving them for voters who actually benefit from them um, by allowing them to cast a, a ballot, a vote independently. Um, Georgia is one such state, Pennsylvania is another such state. Uh, we don't have adequate rules in a lot of places for chain of custody of the ballots, ballot accounting, and so on. Um, then there's some technical issues like how do you generate high quality randomness in a way that the public can verify in order to give people confidence that the sample of ballots that was used in the audit was really selected in a fair way. The way that this has kind of become canonized is through ceremonies where the Secretary of State's office or the local election official uh, invites the public to come and roll dice that become the seed of the pseudo random number generator that's then used to select the sample of ballots. Um, there can be other wrinkles around, uh, you, you're going to try to retrieve a particular ballot that your audit says you should look at and you can't find it. Um, you don't have a good list of all your ballots, things like that. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of issues, most of which have uh, technical solutions um, so that you can still end up with a really valid risk limiting audit. That is, you can really ensure that the chance that it doesn't correct the outcome, if the outcome is wrong, is at most, say, 5%. <clears throat> Uh, there's open source software that implements all of these things, uh, a number of tools written by, uh, by me. Uh, Arlo is uh, an open source project uh, run by VotingWorks. It was derived from Colorado's election audit software. Uh, the Arlo people are actually on the other side of this Georgia uh, fight um, that I've been talking about. And in particular, what the state of Georgia has proposed to do is to audit do a risk limiting audit of one contest every two years selected by the Secretary of State. Um, so this is an example of someone trying to use risk limiting audits to whitewash a fundamentally insecure voting system. And I'm you know, actually really kind of distraught that my invention is being used to undermine the security of elections rather than to improve the security of elections. This has really been a source of a lot of consternation for me. Um, and uh, the fact that I'm, you know, fight, you know, on some level, I'm delighted that this thing has gotten a lot of traction, but I'm also really upset that it's actually being, being weaponized in a way that, that undermines the whole point. At the end of the day, you know, what do we need to have uh, secure and trustworthy elections? Um, we have to have a voter verified audit trail um, generally, that means hand-marked paper ballots. If you have a hand-marked paper ballot, the ballot necessarily reflects what the voter did. If you have a machine-marked paper ballot because it's a ballot marking device or something else, then the paper record reflects what the machine did, which is not necessarily what the voter did. If you voted in California, you know that very often our ballots can have 30 or 40 different things to vote on. And the idea that someone can glance at a piece of printout and tell whether a contest was removed, whether a selection was altered. Um, it's, just, it's just a very, very difficult cognitive task. I personally can't do it without bringing in a sample ballot to compare you know, what, what's there to what I intended to do because I took my time marking the sample ballot at home very carefully. So creating a, a, a complete durable verified audit trail generally means hand marked paper ballots for the vast majority of voters. Um, then we need to curate that auto tra audit trail to make sure that it's complete and accurate throughout the canvas and any subsequent auditing that takes place. And finally, we need an audit that checks whether the electronic tabulation of the votes, in fact, gave the correct winners, whether the reported winners really did win. Um, one interesting distinction between election auditing and financial auditing there's a notion of materiality. Um, you know, when you audit, it's always, you know, there, there, it's, an, it's inevitable that there will be some errors, some problems on some level. And the question is, do they rise to the level of being material? And in financial uh, situations, generally, excuse me, um, generally uh, the, the threshold for materiality is uh, would an investor who knew what the right numbers were have made a different decision. So if the facts, if, if someone had known uh, the actual facts rather than what was reported, would their decision have been different? 
That's a very difficult thing to get at. And so that tends to get translated into an arbitrary threshold like, did the error, did the error exceed 10%? Um, with the idea that anything less than 10% is de minimis and people would have, would have invested the same way. In elections, there's a much clearer line for what counts as material. An error is material if it caused the wrong candidate or candidates to appear to win. Um, that is not a 10% threshold. That is a threshold that actually varies with the closeness of the contest. The, the narrower the margin, the less error it would have taken to alter who won. And so the auditing methods need to be sensitive to that and give higher scrutiny to contests that would, where a smaller amount of error could have changed the outcomes. Um, there have been, uh, okay, the, the, the workload is not high. Um, if we looked at uh, the state level presidential contest from 1992 to 2012, um, in general, m most states would have had to look at fewer than 308 ballots at the state level. The entire state would have only had to look at 308 ballots. Um, the, in the 2016 presidential election nationally, we would have had to look at about 700,000 ballots to confirm the outcome of 5% risk limit. There have now been about 60 pilots of these things in a bunch of different states and in Denmark, uh, a bunch of different counties in California. Uh, uh, risk limiting audits have been routine in Colorado since 2017, although they, they audit two contests uh, in each election. And there were statewide audits uh, just this year in the uh, Democratic primaries in Alaska, Kansas, and Wyoming. Uh, there are laws now in about five states uh, requiring or authorizing the use of, of risk homing audits. And I will just, um, okay, I think, I'll, I think I'll shut up um, and open things for discussion. Great. Uh, thank you. Do we have any any questions for Philip? I have a question. You mentioned something that the blockchain is not a solution. Could you please elaborate on why? Sorry, I, I didn't didn't hear the question. Say again, please. So you said earlier that blockchain is not a solution. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Um, you know, what does a blockchain accomplish? Uh, it basically makes the data immutable without being able to detect that there was a change, but it does nothing to ensure that the data that are put in the chain are themselves valid data. So what it is, is kind of garbage in, garbage forever. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem of ensuring that the electronic data are correct in the first place. It does nothing to solve the authentication problem, which is one of the bigger problems in remote voting. Um, the, the companies that have been marketing blockchain voting solutions like Votes, uh, I think I've got some information there in that, in that deck, uh, they are doing things that completely compromise voter privacy and possibly compromise the security of the voters' devices in the process of trying to authenticate whether, whether someone is a, a legitimate voter who's entitled to cast a ballot. So the, the, the difficult problems are really around um, verification, uh, ensuring privacy of the vote, um, not, uh, not kind of distributing trust across some large number of entities in order to ensure that you could see a problem. We're always going to be stuck trusting election officials. Um, many of the quote unquote blockchain voting solutions are not even distributed blockchains. They are provisioned blockchains where uh, only the vendor has access. Thank you. Sure. Do we have more questions from the audience? I have a ton of questions, but I'll ask one. Uh, are, are there really, um, what would happen if a risk li limiting audit said wrong wrong candidate, or are there examples? Do you have a lot of examples of these? And then all of a sudden, are you back in courts? Or, or what happens then? Well, okay, so by definition, <clears throat> a risk limiting audit needs to have the legal power to correct the outcome if the outcome is wrong, <clears throat> or it cannot limit that risk. You've got something else that's maybe setting off an alarm. How does a risk limiting audit determine that the outcome was wrong? 
it doesn't do it by statistics. It does it by conducting an internal oh. manual tally, right? Yeah. And in the places where this is a matter of law, like Colorado, if the audit proceeds to perform manual tally and that finds a different answer, it just replaces the reported answer. And that happens before the results are certified. Now, the state of Virginia has a risk limiting audit law, quote unquote risk limiting audit law, but it says you can't do the audit. See. So it doesn't have the power to overturn election. So it isn't really a risk limiting audit. They're just using the words. I see. Um, so, so there are legal hurdles after the operational, well, after the convincing, the persuasion hurdles, and then the implementation hurdles followed by the legal hurdles. In it it getting depends on how, it, on, on how the laws work. I mean, in, in California, we've done a number of risk limiting audits that were intended to be legally binding. That is that if the audit had progressed to a full hand count, there was a commitment by the election official that that would replace the reported outcome if, if it differed from the reported outcome. Um, I mean, this is really a question of political law. I don't know yeah. what to say. So far, no, no risk limiting audit has discovered that the outcome was wrong. They have found small errors in the tabulation, but not errors that were big enough to alter the reporting number. Thank you. More questions? Bob, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've got one. So um, there's controversy now about voting by mail and allegations that that is inherently um, rife with fraud. Um, now, presumably in a vote by mail, um, you've got a piece of paper which is marked by whoever fills the ballot out. Um, so that would look better in terms of many of your concerns. Um, and the issue would be more like, um, you know, did somebody other than the voter request the ballot? Did somebody other than the voter fill in the ballot? Um, 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 did the post office, you know, deliberately lose those from Democratic precincts? Um, issues like that. I, do you have any um, thing to say about that process? Uh, um, you know, beyond, well, the whole system is subject to fraud. So why should we care so much about potential fraud in um, in mail ballots? Or I, I don't know. What do you think about that? So um, it turns out that something like ten percent of votes that are cast by mail don't get counted because of avoidable errors, like failing to sign the ballot envelope um or putting an identifying mark on the ballot that makes it illegal for the election official to count the ballot but there's definitely a problem around voter error in filling out the ballot there are some jurisdictions where if you don't sign it or if your signature doesn't match your signature on record you get some notice and an opportunity to cure the problem so that your ballot will still count um, there are other jurisdictions that don't provide notice or don't provide adequate uh, period of time to cure. And so you're likely to be disenfranchised if you make a mistake. The rate of errors like that tends to be higher in younger voters and first time vote by mail voters. So there's an educational, you know, there's an opportunity to have better outreach and education to decrease the rate of disenfranchisement that way. Um, I am really concerned about states that are deciding to mail a ballot to every registered voter, whether they've requested or not because that is putting an enormous number of votes of, of blank ballots out there. Um, the evidence that there is fraud in vote by mail is relatively small. I mean, there was a recent example, was it in New Jersey, uh, of like a mailbox that had several hundred ballots in it and there was suspicion that it was someone stuffing you know, the ballot box that they collected ballot blank ballots from people and were marking them on their behalf. Um, and I, I think that there's been, there's some prosecution around that, but there have been, I don't know, four or five serious national investigations of fraud and vote by mail and nobody's turned, including by Republican administrations, and nobody's turned up more than a handful of examples of this. The biggest problem seems to be ballot harvesting in places like um, 
uh, assisted living facilities where someone can go and collect a bunch of blank ballots from people and, and mark them on their behalf. There similarly are concerns around coercion and vote selling, and in particular coercion by employers and labor unions, where if, you're, if, you, if everyone gets a vote by mail ballot, um, then uh, you know, the, 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 the nightmare scenario is your employer says, okay, everybody come into the cafeteria, sign your envelope and we'll take care of the rest for you. Um, so that, that's, that's a concern, but all of these concerns are in some sense retail rather than wholesale. You need physical access to the ballots in order to do this, whereas you don't need physical access to the ballots to hack the voting machines or to hack online voting or things like that. So it's, it's very difficult to do at scale. The, the larger, you know, the, the more ballots you try to alter this way or, or, or you know, pirate in some way, the more um, uh, accomplices you need and the more likely it is somebody's gonna say something and somebody's gonna get caught. It's just a very different kind of vulnerability. That said, um, I am not really comfortable mailing my ballot back. I would far rather drop it off at a supervised kiosk, uh, some kind of a drop box or something like that. Um, I tend to use the one that's in front of uh, City Hall here in Berkeley um, to, to drop. I, I get a vote by mail ballot. I take my time voting it and then I drop it off physically either into that, uh, that drop box or I drop it off in person at the polling place um, to cut the post office out of the middle. Uh, as you know, uh, DeJoy is um, you know, gutting the US Post Office. It's a very serious concern. The rules around how, when a ballot needs to arrive, either be postmarked and or arrive uh, at the election office in order to be counted vary from state to state. California is relatively generous. There are some states where it basically needs to arrive by election day or it doesn't get counted no matter when it's postmarked. Um, <clears throat> So that's, that's definitely of concern. Um, you know, there, there are trade-offs. I, I, I think that of the options that are currently available in California that lets you keep some physical distance from things to protect yourself from, uh, uh, you know, from COVID, coronavirus, um, you know, probably the best is get an absentee ballot and drop it off in person in, in a drop box or a polling place. So. Oh, another, uh, another thing I'm worried about is there are states that are allowing people to print ballots at home uh, using their office printer, print a blank ballot, and then fill it out by hand and drop it off. This is a problem for a number of reasons. One is it makes it very easy to uh, attack um, election officials' ability to deal with things by simply flooding them with a bunch of bogus ballots that they then need to go through and weed out. So even if it's obvious on some level that it's bogus, if you send enough of them, you've got the equivalent of a denial, denial of service attack on a server, um, they have to go through it. Secondly, the vast majority of ballots that come in on office paper rather than on heavy ballot card stock need to be remade by hand. So they end up with, with teams of a couple of people in the uh, election office looking at the whatever the voters sent in and then trying to copy the marks by hand onto a proper piece of ballot stock so that that can be scanned by the scanners. So they don't count what you send in, they duplicate it. Um, that process can be error prone. That process generally isn't audited. Um, you know, that, and it's extremely time consuming. So if jurisdictions get, you know, thousands and thousands of ballots that need to be remade, that's gonna be, that, that's gonna be a major problem. Sean, you're muted. Thank you so much. Um, what are, can you talk about the relative expenses of various kinds of voting systems and like how does your, your proposals, if they were properly implemented, compare on a cost basis? And are, is like technical cost really a determining factor here? Yeah, so uh, the ballot marking devices that uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania are rolling out and the ones that uh, Los Angeles is, is trying to roll out are substantially more expensive both in the original acquisition cost and in ongoing costs for configuration, maintenance, and so on than hand-marked paper ballots are. 
Um, the probably the least expensive system to field is to have hand-marked paper ballots in the polling place that are then centrally scanned and tabulated in election officials' offices. You can get relatively inexpensive high-speed scanners that tend to be far more accurate than the um, lighter duty scanners that are deployed in polling places. Uh, it, it's, you can, you're then using office equipment that it's easy to lease to replace whatever rather than specialized voting equipment and paper is relatively cheap um, compared to you know, memory cards and, uh, and, and the, the amount of labor that's involved in configuring the devices for each election because for each new election you have to program it to say, you know, who are the candidates? What are the contests? What are the ballot styles? What does a, what does a mark on this piece of paper mean in this particular place and so on? So right now, the most economical thing is actually the most secure thing. And one really needs to wonder about the motives of election officials, especially statewide, who are choosing to spend more money for less security. Thank you. Uh, just one comment about motives. Uh, um, what's that famous quote about? Don't don't attribute to uh, bad intentions. Malice. Intent that, that which you can explain yes. with incompetence. I mean, yeah. I, I no doubt people have their own reasons for doing things, but I think that, that the um, subject is difficult, widely misunderstood. Um, yeah, well, let, let me just give you a, a couple of examples just to, to see if we can maybe tip you from the incompetence uh, side of the balance somewhere else. The, there is a revolving door between these uh, election equipment vendors and government offices. Um, uh, Brian Kemp, who was the Secretary of State of Georgia, who ran an election where there's really clear statistical evidence that hundreds of thousands of votes from black voters were not counted um, and ran the election of his own election for governor. Um, his, I know this is chief of staff or someone very high up and works for, worked for systems, which is the system they just bought um, at a factor of six times the price that a hand paper ballot system would have cost. Um, in Philadelphia, you saw, saw the example that the company they ended up buying these, these unnecessarily expensive devices from uh, was caught doing illegal lobbying and they bought it anyway, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised. Well, you know, I, I um, manage money for yeah. financial services. So, so these aren't unusual sorts of stories, right? I mean, people in power, there's an old saying about people in power, but still, um, I mean, I, I think that the educational aspect of this is, is really the most powerful in the long run mm -hmm. for me personally, just despite what may or may not be going on. I really appreciate your putting it together in such a, a non-technical and widely appealing uh, way. I mean, I, can we circulate this recording and, and stuff or is that? Yeah, sure. So we, we, then we will. Uh, <laughs> The slides are up uh, online already. If, if you, if you, if anybody wants to look at the technical stuff that's in there as well, and then there's some links to things. Yeah, we we already got one request for that from the audience, but of course we want to go out further, and we, we can post a link maybe on CDAR as well to your slides and great like this recording around. So um, more more uh, more questions from anybody. Hi, Mitch. <laughs> Hey, Philip, how are you? Thank you again. It was an excellent talk, as always. Uh, oh, thanks. I'm curious what you see. You have much more experience in this than I do, at least. What's your biggest concern in terms of, like, California voting, since that's coming up very soon? Uh, are, do you think California is relatively on top of things? It seems not to be in your top of picks of... Yeah, it's a mix. I, mean, I, I guess I'm more concerned about things. So, first of all, at least all California counties vote on paper. Um, since Deborah Bowen, you know, kind of decertified uh, when she was Secretary of State and conditionally recertified some things. So that's a good thing. We're used to voting by mail, so it's not going to be a huge change of how we conduct our elections um, this time around. I think we were already up to roughly 60% vote by mail, and the California Voter Choice Act, you know, was really pushing towards having even more voting by mail. 
So there are definitely security weaknesses and in voting by mail and ballots do get lost. And I wish that we had better rules around chain of custody for ballots and we do not require risk limiting audits. And Dean Logan, the registrar of voters in LA County that I've been um, expressing some of my discomfort with and about, um, managed to get a bill proposed and passed from, um, uh, from Quirk, uh, uh, Assembly Member Quirk, that exempted, it had the effect of exempting vote by mail ballots from California's audits, which is really pretty crazy since they're tabulated on different equipment and they account for more than half the votes at this point. Now, basically anything that hasn't arrived as of election day is exempt from audit under the current rule. That said, California also has a new bill, AB 2125, uh, and then a, a revision of that, I don't remember its number, AB 2400, that uh, the governor just signed into law a couple of weeks ago for piloting risk limiting audits more broadly, um, lowering the kind of barriers to entry in, in some way. So we're, we're, we're going in a good direction. I really don't like uh, the expansion of touchscreen voting machines, which LA is, you know, is doing in, in, in a very big way. They're by far the biggest county in California. They're bigger than you know, almost every other state. I mean, they're bigger than most countries. It's an enormous jurisdiction. Um, but at least from the perspective of the presidential contest, I think who's gonna win in California is pretty clear. And I'm you know, kind of more concerned about Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, uh, where they have a combination of you know, tight contests and bad election security. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you're not alone in that one. No. Uh, great. Other questions? Well, uh, with that, I will uh, not stand between this group and lunch. Uh, Philip, thank you for a, a really fin another fantastic talk. Oh, we, so much. we have uh, all the materials, so please get in touch with Philip directly or me or, or Mujin uh, if you'd like recording, slides, uh, more questions for Philip and so on. And uh, stay safe out there, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thanks a lot.